It's surprising to me if you look up online reviews of Sleepaway Camp 1983, just how many of them dismiss this film as a Friday the 13th ripoff or just another in the, the huge list of the early 80s slasher films, just the typical formulaic type of thing. It's neither of these. This came out during the golden era of the slasher, but it breaks a lot of conventions, and it does things kind of its own way. It's almost kind of like in its own little genre, in a way. It did not do well at the box office at all, to which the writer-director, uh, Robert Hiltzik, was not even aware of the cult following until around the turn of the century. This film um, stars Felissa Rose as Angela, and she did not do a whole lot else besides this movie. Uh, it has um, Catherine Kami, uh, who stars as Meg. Um, she was um, she was Pamela in All My Children. She was Mar uh, uh, Marcy in Guiding Light in the late eighties. She is the uh, she is the real mean counselor in this who has some also has some strange like daddy issues going on I'll talk about that later uh, Jonathan Tiersten plays uh, Ricky Thomas I like that name it remind it rhymes with a great singer Ricky Thomas and he is the cousin of Angela and this guy is a really good character. He's been to the camp before. He's like, he kind of, he shows up and kind of struts like he's, he knows all the ins and outs. Uh, he knows that a lot of the camp is going to suck, but he makes the most of it. He knows people in the camp. He kind of, he kind of helps Angela because she's real socially withdrawn and he, he takes it upon himself to guard her. He is a, a real puny guy, but he stands up to the bullies. He's a he's just a real likable character. I really do like Ricky. Uh, Christopher Collett, who's kind of his buddy, plays plays his buddy Paul. He was in, he was the lead. Well, the um, he had a big role in Manhattan Project 1986 with John Lithgow. It was Lithgow and Collett. Uh, Christopher Collett plays is Paul. He's kind of the buddy. Uh, things go well for Paul. He's he gets a connection going with Angela, and even gets like a little romance thing started. And things are, and he's he's really in a good mood about this until this other character, Judy, uses him and comes between he and Angela, and and ends up making out in the woods with him. It, just out of spite for Angela, who catches him doing it, and then things don't go well for Paul after that. He starts to grovel at her feet, beg her to, to give him another chance. So he's kind of that character, uh, pretty relatable. Uh, both, uh, so Angela, uh, Paul, and, and Ricky are all kind of like middle school age, 13 maybe 12, uh, but the the real, like, the meanest girl is played by Karen Fields, Judy. We get the feeling she's maybe like 14, maybe a year older than the main three, but boy, she's really, <laughs> she's just like the worst character in this, and because uh, she's kind of more, she's matured physically, faster than some of the other ones. Um, she used it to her advantage. She was not in much. Karen Fields is her name. She just, she's not in much else. She was in a, a kind of a spinoff film called Judy, 2014, about the character from the film, so whatever. And then you have the, the camp, like, not really the owner, but like the main director guy of the camp. Uh, can I get the feeling he's the owner, though? The way he talks about how they're going to shut us down and, you know, he's, he's, they're trying to ruin me. Someone out there is doing killings. But uh, he plays Mel, who is the the main guy. He's an old guy. 
He wears shorts and like jacked up socks. He's just very, um, he's not very handsome looking. Uh, this guy, Mike Kellen, was in uh, at war with the army in 1950 with Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. And he was also in the Boston Strangler, 1968. And I've never seen that one. But yeah, Mike Kellen, who is kind of a, 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 a male, is a little bit of a red herring through part of this as the possible killer. He's a, he's a funny character, though. If you, <laughs> He's kind of a one that grows on you. Some of the counselors, we have Paul D'Angelo, played by... Uh, Played by Ronnie D Ronnie Angelo, similar name. Is it no? I think it's Ronnie Angelo is the name. Yeah, Ronnie Angelo is the name of the counselor. Played by Paul D'Angelo. Pretty sure this is an orderly guy. He's re he's like real buffed up. He's got this real New York accent. Um, the director writer is went to NYU. This is kind of a New York based film. There's a lot of there's some real New York accents, even in the little kids in the be beginning sequence. And this guy's got a real thick, like, New York accent. He's, like, all buffed up, and he wears, like, real tight, uh, like, nut huggers, like, around the camp. These little workout shorts, and I guess they're just normal in the 80s, and you know, show, he's got big muscles, uh, and he's uh, he's real, he's he's got strictness to him, but he's also got a little bit of, he can be a little sensitive, and he can like he helps out Angel a little bit and stuff like that, so he's kind of he, he, and he's he's real uh, thoughtful after one of the kids gets killed under the canoe, and he's you know he talks to the police about it and he's um, you know kind of thinking back. I thought that boy was a real good swimmer, you know he's real um, so he's you know kind of a, a, a well developed character I think. Thomas E Van De <laughs> Thomas E Van Dell. Uh, plays Mike. I kind of forget who Mike is. Susan Glaze is uh, Susie. She's now she's a nice counselor of the girls, so she's the she's the one like good counselor as far as the girls are concerned. Where she kind of helps Angela out, and then some others kind of will confide in her sometimes. So she's kind of she's nice until she gives Judy a nice slap in the face. <laughs> Uh, she's kind of, you know, um, kind of tests her there. But uh, the another counselor is Frank Trent Saladino, plays Gene. I kind of like Gene in this. He's uh, he's another counselor of the boys. He's kind of he's not as he's not as um, strict as Ronnie, but he you know he does take Mozart's knife away. He's, he's a little more goofy, he's a little more loose as a counselor. He's probably a little younger, and he's pretty cool, though. I like him. Uh, Frank Trent Saladino is also in the first Turn On. I think it's an early 80s comedy, and this was made by the Hertz Kaufman team that did Splatter University. So I think I've seen it. I don't remember if I've seen it or not, but if I did, it's pretty forgettable. I mentioned Mozart. This is Willie Cuskin. I like Mozart. He's kind of the he's kind of the dorky guy. He's the guy who has the knife. He kind of freaks out when they do a prank on him with shaving cream, and he grabs his knife and he threatens to kill him. And right there, you see he, Mozart is a little bit of a. I think it's done to be a little bit of a red herring on who's the killer. You also see him in the baseball scene, which is one of my favorite scenes in the film. The the it's like the older boys playing the kind of younger boys in baseball, and the younger guys end up winning. But Mozart's in the outfield playing this little electronic, forget what kind of, maybe some kind of sports game, and he's like in the outfield not paying attention and playing this little electronic game that they had in the early 80s. And then they hit a fly ball, and he's like throws the <laughs> whoops and, and runs and makes the play. But, but Mozart's pretty cool. I like him. Uh, Owen... Uh, Owen Hutches, Owen oh, Hutches, Owen Hughes plays Artie. This is a real creepy guy. This is what I'm talking about about really breaking conventions. Having this uh, head, he's the head cook. We find out later, but he's the head co uh, like cook chef of the camp, 
and he's uh, like he should be in a like locked up somewhere the way he talks about the the kids and stuff and it's like it's just he's like just does it without like unapologetically um he you know, he tries to do something with Angela in the little walk-in room. It's really weird. And he ends up getting killed right after it. But I will say, like, he's a... Owen Hughes does a really good job of selling this character and and just really making him just slimy. Desiree Gold is is um, another... We, we lost her recently, but she plays Art Martha. And she's one of the reasons that Angela is so messed up. You, you get a glimpse of her in the one of the early scenes and she is first of all she's overacting a lot but she's she's really weird she's got you can tell something's completely off with her um who else do we have in this we have robert earl jones who is like the assistant cook he, he plays ben the assistant cook he gets promoted to head cook after the death of our man Artie. Uh, Robert Earl Jones, the father of James Earl Jones, and in real life he was also a boxer, which is kind of cool. A professional boxer, I should say. And then some others worth noting, we have Frank the Cop, who's played by Alan Breton, and I like this guy. He's, he's, uh, he's real human, and he's the way he reacts to like one, the death of the guy or the canoe, and then to the death of of Meg seeing her body and he's he's a pretty cool character I think his he's got like a weird porn mustache I mean, he reminds me a lot of the of the deputy guy in Bog in 1979 so that's another reason I like him there's also I have to mention Loris uh, Salahian he played Billy so he's the Billy is one of the older boys and he's kind of the head guy of some other Real annoying guys. Um, I'll, we'll just call them Billy's crew. They're like the bullies. They bully Angela. They bully others. They are um, just an annoying group. It's just the the type that really just the one of the reasons I never went to one of these camps. I have no regrets whatsoever whatsoever about not going to one of these camps because it's, this is paints such a realistic picture of what it would have been like and what I've heard these camps were like. Finally, Archie Liberace plays Naked Angela at the end. Okay. All right. Um, yeah. This has a killer at a summer camp, but it is by no means a Friday the 13th uh, ripoff. Okay, so this the, the killer's kills are all based on revenge um, as opposed to like the just the meaningless mayhem you see it you saw from Mike Myers and um, and uh, others you know Freddy Krueger or whatever but so it's all like revenge based the murders uh, were all meant to like punish a specific incidents and it's climax with a complete outburst of violence at the end, which is directed towards everyone who is remaining who did wrong to the killer uh, throughout the movie. And so every, the early ones, the early kills in the film are set up so quickly that you could just pass them off as being random accidents, whereas the rest at the end, they happen so quickly that you can't... You can see why the other characters who are left fail to pick up on them before it's too late. And since there's just a complete lack of a non-murdering protagonist, there's no last girl or last boy like you see in all these slasher films. It falls completely to the authority who are left, to, like a couple of counselors, which breaks a com completely... Uh, shatters another typical slasher early 80s horror film convention uh, it falls to the authority for them to uncover the, the killing spree and see what's happened see what's happened when they when they uncover the the big payoff scene at the end 
the writer, um, the guy who wrote this, uh, produces such a desired effect and such a like like presumptuous conclusion that he doesn't even bother with a showdown between Angela and the counselors who were left. There was no need to do it. it if, he, if he had, it just would have been overkill. He leaves you with a shocking ending. And a lot of people say that, I've seen some reviews where they say, well, it's, it's obvious from the beginning that Angela is the killer. Uh, I have no problem admitting that they, they snuck it over my head because I was, and granted, I was very new to the slasher genre when I first saw this. It was one of the first ones that I rented from the video store. So I hadn't, I was real, really not familiar as most with the whole, like, the whole slasher thing and kind of picking up on clues and stuff. But uh, it, it, they got it over my head, but... Um, you know, it's it is. <laughs> Sometimes you just they throw they do throw some red herrings in there, and I will just say the the ending of this film is more probably the probably the most memorable scene in a in an eighty slasher film to end to end a movie. The first time I saw it, I was absolutely paralyzed just staring at the TV as the credits are rolling that you see her face and the the Frankie Vinci song Angela you're just what I'm looking for plays through the credits and I just sat there completely paralyzed like it was that that ending was that effective and if you see it you'll never forget it if you've seen it you know what I'm talking about there's a lot of taboo things in here that were not seen in other other 80s horror films. You have that, I talked about the cook, that was very creepy. The, there's a flashback that Angela has to her, to her, um, her and her brother watching her dad and the dad's boyfriend. That's, you know, you don't see that kind of thing, like, <laughs> and they're giggling. That was weird and unexpected, but again, it's a, it's a real, uh, you know, shock value kind of thing. You have I talked about the me, the Mel Meg relationship. So the so Mel played by played by Mike Kellen, this guy who looks like he's this was his final movie, by the way. This was Mike Kellen. I think he died in nineteen eighty three. It may have come out right after he died. He's probably in his maybe late sixties in the in the film, but he looks like he could be, you know, 70, early 70s, mid 70s even. And then you have Meg, who's this really good looking counselor. She's, she's got a bad attitude, but she's really, really good looking. And she's like hitting on him and wants to like have dinner with him. And he's like touching her and, and stuff. And it's just out in the open. It's like, I don't know what the heck would that was what was going on there. She's got some, she has some kind of issues, but it's just a strange thing that the director throws into the film. And I know, understand that it's her death that ultimately sets him off to find, you know, to kill who he thinks is the killer. He thinks it's Ricky doing the killing and they do a good job of showing him as, as a red herring too. Ricky, the cousin, he's threatening to kill the older boys the crew, Billy's crew of of bullies, so they that is kind of a red herring thing. But the relationship there, they could have at least used a counselor closer to his age or age difference, but like that is a weird thing to watch in this. Oh, kind of taboo look kind of thing, but I don't know what she saw in him, but something going on there. Uh, there's also like a camp of there's some like 12 year old like real young boys who were just slaughtered it, towards the end that's that's real that's really off the the grid for for uh for slasher films but the realism is really the uh, where this movie hits it on the on the uh hits the, ball, the nail on the head for me in this and for a lot of people a, a lot of realism here the, the camp i talked about how it doesn't paint the camp as being this glorious thing it's it's crappy cabins it's like 
a lot of focus and time spent on these tedious activities that aren't really that fun and they're just trying to get through them. The volleyball that you can tell they they don't really want to play. Nothing really looks fun. Okay, <laughs> uh, the campers, um, the boys and girls, just being f awful to one another. I mean, in fact, the only time that the girls are you see girls being nice to each other is when they're bonding over their hatred of another girl, or maybe in some cases another boy. So like uh, boys just p playing awful pranks on each other. Uh, using a lot of foul language. Uh, there's uh, the food. There's some references to the food being, the meals they serve being crappy. You even see scenes and showing the food, and it's just it's really bad stuff. I like the counselor, the variations in the counselors. And I've talked about this with the cast list. I like how you have uncaring counselors. You have real like one like like Meg. It was a complete jerk to everybody uh, and then you have you know a couple that are caring that you can kind of come to and express your concerns and I think this is real real there's always you know maybe a couple of counselors like that at these camps who are who are kind of down to earth and like really genuinely want to help but there's also a lot of them are just kind of like there for a job or they're just uh, maybe look there for girls you know um, can't wait to get, you know, like the night off. There's some like references to that. There's the guy who is, or he's told he's got the duty of taking the boys out camping for the night. It's like this group of like 12 year old boys. And he's just openly like, you know, this sucks. You know, like I don't want to do this. Why did I draw this car? Anyone want to trade with me? So, you know, it's just obvious how you see a lot of just the variations in the, the different counselors, I think is really cool. And there's the whole like, the whole like sexual type of thing going on with like, just like kind of the, you have the Christopher Collette, Paul, Christ Christopher Collette, just angling to try to get second base or the, you know, the, the stolen kiss from Angela, just getting, just taking whatever little that she would give him and then you have, on the other hand, the older boys, you know, Billy's crew, they cannot convince even one girl to go skinny dipping with them in that one scene. And, you know, they're like, there's a group of them and they just leave and, and they're, the, the, you know, you can tell Billy's all ticked off about it and fun, you know, you don't know how to have fun anyways. But it's so, it's so much closer to realism than, you know, compared to, Friday the thirteenth, the final chapter where they where the boy or the boys and the and the girls, these teenagers, they all just easily strip and they get into the lake and everything's great, you know, it's like it's so easy. And the whole thing with Paul in this movie, like trying to he's trying to get under her shirt and she's saying no, just you know, he's trying to get a little bit of, you know, something going on with her and you know, a little making out with her like it's such such so much closer to reality as compared to Kevin Bacon in Friday the 13th 1980 just plowing away as a counselor you know just easily with the best looking female counselor uh, on hand <laughs> so it's just the realism of this film is so much better so this is not a formulaic film is a is a great film it's better than friday the 13th 1980 it might be better than friday the 13th part two but i like part two i think a little better than this movie but if you want to see the formulaic watch sleepaway camp 2 1987 with pamela springsteen playing angela this one is it's 1987, so it's comedy. It's a different writer, a different director, a different producer. So you, you're not you're not getting what you'd hope for if you liked the first one. But I will say, Sleepaway Camp Two is a good it's a good movie. It's a pretty good if you if you just know your expectations going into it. It's pretty good. It's a it's it's definitely worth a watch. Uh, Sleepaway Camp Three. Also with Pamela Springsteen, it was not good at all. 
And then there was Return to Sleepaway Camp 2008, which brought back Felissa Rose as Angelo. It brought back Jonathan Kirsten as Ricky, and it brought back D'Angelo as the as Ronnie, the, the counselor. So you had those three in it. And I haven't seen this, but I've seen a review that a trust that they say is terrible, it's not worth watching. So I'd stay away from that one as well. But definitely watch, take a shot at Sleepaway Camp 1983. Uh, that's Mike Kellen right there. May he rest in peace. And then that's the nice counselor right there. Kind of weird they only show those two. This one has the right, the commentary and stuff, but uh, it's just a, just a very good film. I, I like it a lot. Uh, it's it's as far as camp horror movies, it's probably a top two or three for me. So um, definitely paints a perfect picture of what <laughs> the horrid uh, camp experience was like during that uh, during that time and. The beginning kind of opening thing is done in a, in a different way too, kind of the setup thing. It's, it's backtracks to when it was originally shut down and then it goes to like into the uh, a little further, a little more into the future, but it's still the past, like with the accident with Angela when she's younger and then it goes to the camp. So it's a little different from what the setup you see normally. That's my review of Sleepaway Camp 1983. I don't have the VHS. I need the VHS. That's what I originally saw this on. So, um, thanks for watching, and thanks also if you watch this. Uh, you won't be you won't be disappointed. It has, it's well paced, and it's really exciting and just an unforgettable conclusion. Great song at the end. Thanks for watching. Take care.